I'd like to call to order the Saline Area Schools Board of Education meeting of April 9th, 2024. Uh, standing as you are able, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Brad Gerby. We'll do it. Choir. What what choir? Choir? Oh, better. Choir, are you ready? Where are they? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Claire. Guess you weren't afraid that they wouldn't speak up. I know. I we have two brief uh, pieces of superintendent recognition to begin with. Okay, I will start um, on behalf of directors Floatkey and Price. We have tonight the SMS and SHS choirs, and I'm gonna read a long list of accomplishments. The Selene Middle School Choir Program is 200 plus singers strong and is composed of five choirs. The sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade curricular choirs and two advanced extracurricular choirs that rehearse before school, girls choir and boys choir. Middle school singers learn the fundamentals of singing using a diverse selection of music. Singers learn how to work together as an ensemble to make beautiful music and make lasting friendships at the same time. They perform multiple concerts a year ranging from a sixth grade behind the scenes concert where the audience gets a sneak peek into a sixth grade choir rehearsal to our formal pre-festival concerts. The seventh, eighth grade girls and boys choirs are currently preparing for their annual pops concert where singers get to learn and perform pop music with our live four piece band. The middle school choirs consistently receive high ratings at the MSBMA Choral Festivals, including this year where Girls Choir also received a perfect score in sight reading. We also have multiple students audition and make it into the middle school state honors choir program. This year, five singers made it to the state level. The commitment and enthusiasm that these young singers have helps continue to make the Celine Choir programs the success that it is today. Now on to the SHS choirs. Celine High School Choir Program includes three extracurricular ensembles and three extracurricular groups who rehearse outside of the school day. Students learn diverse repertoire and styles from around the world and throughout musical history. Choirs sing an extended major work with our orchestra students. Students are currently rehearsing for their POPs Cabaret Concert Project in which students create, manage, and perform their own acts in a musical variety show format. Celine Choirs consistently receive top ratings at MSVMA choral festivals and solo and ensemble events, and singers place into the state honors choirs every year. Choirs have been selected to perform numerous times in the MSVMA All-State Festival, the Michigan Youth Arts Festival, and the Michigan Music Conference Choral Hour. Students sing alongside of the school setting at events like our Fall Choir Retreat, Caroling in the Community, and while touring at major venues like Carnegie Hall, the Detroit Opera House, Hill Auditorium, and Chicago Symphony Center. The choirs went on their first European tour in 2019 to Prague and Austria and returned to touring last year on a trip singing in Chicago. This past year's highlights include Chamber Choir's performance at the Elite Choral Invitational at Michigan State, a collaborative performance at Mozart's Coronation Mass, multiple perfect scores at s &E and choral festivals, work with guest conductor and composer Dr. Brandon Waddles from Wayne State University, and a new student-led barbershop quartet group. The Sling Choir's dedication to fine, expressive singing has built their prestigious reputation in Celine community and beyond. Now I'm gonna ask for the choir, all of you to come up one by one, make your way to the podium and state your name, your year in school, and your role in the choir or choirs. And then we're gonna work our way over to the side here by this monitor and take a picture with the um, Board of Education. So 
come on up, we'll make a line, and then we're gonna start at the podium by making sure that the green light is on. So go ahead and there's a little push button. If you push it and it's green, we can all start. I'm Anna Peefler. I'm in seventh grade. I do seventh grade choir, girls choir, and I did state honors choir. I'm Awara Gust. I'm in eighth grade, eighth grade choir, girls choir, and I did State Honors Choir. Hi, my name is Shia Livingston. I'm in eighth grade. I am in eighth grade choir, girls choir, and, the, and I was in the Michigan State Honors Choir. My name is Anna Kalinstrom. I'm in 10th grade, and I'm the ensemble manager of Cola Voce. My name is Reese Wallover. I'm in 10th grade. I'm in chamber choir, and I'm also a 10 tone. My name is Megan Asnerkapam. I'm in 12th grade. I'm the Hornet Harmonies ensemble manager and in chamber choir. My name's Abigail Sartori. I'm in 11th grade, and I'm part of the publicity crew, crew for um, Cola Voce. My name is Munia Al Awad. I'm a choir council vice president. I'm also in chamber choir and Hornet Harmonies. My name is Delaney Niven. I'm a sophomore, and I'm the Cola Voce student director. My name is Addison Langa. I'm in 10th grade, and I'm in Cola Voce, and I'm in the publicity crew. My name is Isaiah Gifford. I'm a senior, and I'm the ensemble manager of the Ten Tones. Hi, I'm Nikki Steiner. I'm a senior. I'm in chamber choir, and I'm the secretary of choir. Hi, I'm Otto Spittler. I'm a junior, and I'm in chamber choir, and in Ten Tones. I'm Callahan Miltenberger. I'm a senior. I'm in Ten Tones and chamber choir. I'm Katie Boer. I'm a senior in Ten Tones and the choir, the <laughs> choir president. I'm Finn Goss. I am uh, in 11th grade, and I am in chamber choir and ten tones. My name is Evan Schlitt. I'm in 10th grade. I'm in chamber, ten tones, chordsman, barbershop, and I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Isaac Rotten. I'm the student director of the ten tones, and I'm a senior going to Berkeley College of Music next fall. My name is Tyrion Cooper. I am in Chordsman and the Barbershop Club, and I am going to be going to a college for viola performance next year. I'm Sarah Price. I don't know what grade I'm in anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been here for 10 years. It's my 10th year at Celine. And thank you so much um, for honoring us tonight. We have an incredible crew. We're really proud of everything we do. I just want to brag, because a couple of people couldn't be here. We have two others going on to be music teachers next year at um, Michigan State. Oh, Isaiah, and another one as well. So we're just so proud so many are off to do music and to continue singing in all their different ways that they're going to. So here's it. I am Eric Fletke, and this is my eighth year here in Celine. and thanks for having us. And what I like to say is all those older high schoolers that you saw, they were all once this small with me from fifth or eighth grade, too. So it's so awesome to see what they're doing now, too. So thank you. Okay. All right, let's give them a big hand. And if we can get the Board of Education up to take a picture, you may want to Ms. start Martin smushing will together help us just out. a little bit. Okay, and now we are ready mo to move on to our second superintendent's recognition, which is the Celine High School boys hockey team. So on behalf of Coach Zagata and the other assistant coaches 
and parent supporters want to introduce the 2023-24 Celine Hornets boys var varsity hockey team, which just went back to back to back on SEC championships. This, this past year's season, though, and team took a much different path to the title than it had in years past. Faced with adversity from the very start of the season, this year's group may not have always come away with a win, but never let it knock them off course. Facing the toughest schedule of any SEC team, the Hornets played in 12 games that were decided by one goal or less, six of which were decided in overtime. With the SEC conference coming down to the final days of the regular season, we were neck and neck with Ann Arbor Skyline. Needing a win in the last two regular season games, the Hornets clinched the conference championship with a 4-1 win over Temperance Bedford. Led by senior captains Tyler Schroeder, Mateo Idapalo, Aiden Rumor, and Blake Woodrell, Blake and Mateo both eclipsed the 100 career point milestone, while Tyler set the program record for most career wins. Tyler, Mateo, and Blake earned first team all-conference honors, while Aiden and sophomore Antonio Giacalone were named all-conference honorable mention. This year's team earned academic all-state honors with a 3.4 team GPA among one of the highest in the state. I'd like to introduce the boys' hockey team. We'd like everybody to come around, kind of where the choir was over there, and we're going to ask each of the boys to come up, say their name, year in school, and what position you played for with the hockey team, and then we'll ask Coach to, to follow it off. All right, Mateo, you're going to start it off. Hi, I'm Mateo Idapalo, senior, captain, and I play center. I'm Blake Woodrell, senior captain, and I play wing. I'm Tyler Schroeder, senior captain. I play goalie. I'm Ethan Phelps. Uh, I'm a junior. And I play right wing. I'm uh, Jack Boyle, a sophomore, and I played right wing. Uh, Owen Warner, senior, and I played defense. Uh, Johnny Idapalo, I'm a junior, and I play center. I'm Jack Dirksen, I'm a sophomore, and I'm a goalie. Well, I'm Tyson Jacobs, I'm a junior, I play winger. Chris Thornell, I'm a junior and I play defense. Tony Giacalone, and I'm a sophomore and I'm a left winger. Uh, I'm Cooper Dillon, uh, I'm a sophomore and I'm a left wing. Uh, well, thank you guys. I'm Kyle Zagata. I'm the head coach. On behalf of my assistant coaches as well, just like to thank you for all of your support, the community support. This is my fourth year here. Um, we could not have done this. We have a few parent board members uh, in, in attendance here. Um, Matt Idapalo, Kit Woodrill, Janet Dillon, and James Giacalone. They are the uh, uh, part of the parent group that helps make this run and makes my job uh, easier because I just get to focus on coaching. Also, uh, Teresa Steger, our principal, is one of our biggest supporters here. So we're just fortunate for all of the support from our community. And uh, Dr. Lotch, we got you a little gift here as well. All right, picture time. I'm bringing this up. Don't be shy, parents with cameras. Go 
In support of the team, of course, I bleached my hair as well. <laughs> hey, hey. I'd like to uh, take a moment to introduce, he said just call me Rod, uh, the uh, Hot Rods Motorcycle Awareness and Prevention uh, Foundation, and they would just like to present a little gift to us, to the, to the uh, Saline Area School. So come on up, it's all yours. Come on. We never go anywhere alone. Mm -hmm. I know one thing, I don't want to play against that defender. No. <laughs> that a big boy. Good evening, Superintendent Stephen Lash, President Michael McVeigh, and Celine Board of Education. High Rods Motorcycle Awareness and Suicide Prevention Foundation is honored to be part of your suicide prevention and mental health efforts. Tonight, we have the privilege of donating two suicide prevention benches to the Celine School District. Mental health is not a fad. It is very real, and as a group, we know that any and every way you can help a student with resources such as flyers, posters, or benches, it gives them a message that someone really does care and they are not alone. The toll-free number to call is 988 for the Suicide Crisis Lifeline. This lifeline is confidential, free, and available 24 hours a day seven days a week. The Lifeline connects those experience a suicidal crisis with trained counselors. The person will listen to them, understand how their problem is affecting them, provide support, and get them the help they need. We know this message and number works because of stories shared with us where individuals that were contemplating suicide reached out and got the help they needed. Our benches provide hope, support and recess resources to connect. Just one thing I want to add here is uh, Amanda Evers is a 2017 graduate from Celine, and her proud parents are standing right behind me, Bob and Donna. So they wanted to make sure that everybody remembers that we do have a Celine connection. <laughs> so far, we have donated benches to Milan, Dundee, Monroe, Airport, Ida High Schools, and Monroe County Community College. Thank you for your time this evening. God bless all of you here today and keep up the good work and thank you. Any questions? Can, oh, yeah, can somebody bring me bench. that camera back and I'll take a picture of all of oh, you? Oh, we were going to get with the school board and everything over here by oh, our okay. bench if it's, if it's possible. Okay. All I right. just want to thank you again from the board, on behalf of the board, and uh, the next time you do a presentation, you'll be able to add and Celine Area Schools to your <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Right on. Let's go over to the back.
Mrs. Yonke. Thank you. It's, it, well, it's hard to top all that, so let's just end the board meeting <laughs> now. Is it? Oh, no, wait. We've got a few more things on the agenda. There are no, uh, we have nobody in our list uh, for public comment, so I'll skip all past that. I have no response to previous public comment. Um, I'd like to move on to the uh, revisions, approval of the agenda. Items can be added or deleted from the agenda or the order of items changed at the request of an individual board member or the superintendent, and the agenda should or must be approved before proceeding further. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? Uh, so moved, Stebbin. Okay, yes, thank you. Support, E-step. Thank you very much. E-step. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Uh, hearing none. That's all seven of us tonight, right? right. Thank you very much. Uh, we, I'd like to pass over to the, uh, our wonderful student representatives, please. Tonight's student showcase is Pleasant Ridge Student Council. They'll be talking about their leadership skills and how they've helped their school thus far this school year. Was supposed to, there was supposed to be a yellow rope that they were all going to hold, and <laughs> but if the They're person at the front, oh, okay. They're too <laughs> <laughs> you hear laughter, that's my word. I suppose I do have a response to public comment if we go back. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, district for everything they did to provide uh, uh, solar eclipse viewing glasses to everybody. I hope you all had good view. Uh, and I did do some investigation. There will be, we will be in the path of totality for another uh, future eclipse. Uh, September 14th, 2099. <laughs> I'm passing my glasses on to my daughter. She'll be 104. I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to make it. Come on up, guys. I am Mrs. Stacy Guerin, and this is I'm Trina Bell. We're the co-advisors of Pleasant Ridge Student Council, and this is our student council. I'm going to. I'm Garnet Music. I'm Adair Beeman. I'm Madison Richardson. Hello, I'm Madison Miller. Hi, I'm Madison Kendrick. Hi, I'm Jude Sketting. Hi, I'm Reese Brennan. I'm Peter Lecomte. Hello, I'm Hayden Yance. Hi, I'm Juniper Pando. Hi, I'm Kate Dyack. Hi, my name is Skylar Kulik. Hi, I'm Brielle Brooks. Hi, I'm Nora Timmerman. Hi, I'm Elizabeth McHugh. You all can come closer, we don't pay. Come on up. We're reorganizing for a moment. We like little hornets. Oh, perfect. 
who we are. We are third grade leaders, kindness spreaders, and inclusion makers. Here is a picture of us together wearing our t-shirts. Presenting Sacktober. We've collected sacks for Selene Social Services in October as part of the National Sacktober Movement. We have provided thousands of pairs of sacks to those who need them since the pro this project began. We kick off the month with a wild sock day. Sacktober, warm feet equal warm hearts. And we have some pictures of people wearing crazy socks for sock day. Another event we sponsor is the Veterans Day video. We honor veterans connected to PR students and families with a special video. In December, Student Council has supported the nonprofit organization Magic of Christmas for many years. Our families donate gifts to support families in need. We wrap the gifts and deliver them to the founder of the organization. And here are a couple pictures of us helping out. One of the things that we did for Student Council was say heyday. Student Council provided name tags to all the students in the school. We provided links to a book about how to say hello in many languages. We provided a list of many ways how to say hey. Our goal was for everyone to feel included many times throughout the day as people said hello to as many people as possible. Here are 30 ways to say hello. My favorite way to say hello is saying hi to my friends in the morning. My favorite way to say hello is howdy. <laughs> Student Council has also sponsored This Is Me Day. Student Council has sponsored a day where sh students dress to show their interests and personalities in an effort to find commonalities to be inclusive of all. Another event we do is Earth Day. Earth Day grounds clean up, helping our Earth stay free from litter. We also, we also sponsor Student Council store fundraiser for all of our charitable events. We get to practice our math and people skills, too. Here are some things we like about Student Council. We sponsor many fun things in our school. We donate to people in need. We help young, the younger kids know what a leader looks like. We are inclusion makers who spread kindness. We have a nice community and we give back to the community. We encourage people to help others. We have fun. We are the leaders of the building. We are safe and sometimes silly. And that's it, thank you. <laughs> Did the teachers have anything more to add? Because I just wanted to say you were awesome, everybody. Thank you. One more round of applause for them.
for the minutes, I mean. We have five action items this evening. The first is a uh, recommended motion to approve the minutes from the March 12, 2024 closed session for the purpose of superintendent evaluation, section 8A. Do I have a motion? Yes, please. Uh, Brad Gerby, thank you very much. Do we have a second? Uh, Tim Austin is seconding. Uh, we'll uh, do a quick review and uh, put it to a vote. Oh, they're sweet. I'd like to put this to a vote then. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, 7 0. Uh, I also would like to recommend. Uh, Entertain a motion, Jack. Yeah, we'll, it's okay. We can put up with that little bit of noise. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to follow the recommendation of the CARES Advisory Council to approve the allocation of funds as followed in the total amount of fifty-four thousand four hundred eighteen dollars and forty cents, as submitted by Brian Puffer, Director of Director of Community Re Education. And those five projects are the Braille Literacy Project, Literacy uh, Liberty Club, eight hundred dollars. The equipment replacement at Saline Area Senior Center for $7,358. The Lou at Woodland Meadows Elementary, $20,000. Meals on Wheels, the Evangelical Home Foundation, $20,000. The Pool Sound System for the Saline High School Girls Water Polo at $6,260.40. Do we have a motion to rec Do we have so, a motion? So moved. Was that uh, Mr. Rawson? Yep. Thank you. Support Miller. JM, thank you very much. Any, uh, think, whoa, I was going to call you up, but you just it apparated. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Any questions for, or did you have anything to add? I can just go over just a couple things Three. really quick, a little clarifying things possibly. Uh, one, you'll notice the peak um, was not approved. They had a couple um, discrepancies, so we just uh, suggested the board did they approve, um, apply for round three, which is uh, the deadline at the end of this month, so they're going to be applying for round three. Uh, there'll be plenty of money left for that. Uh, so that's why they were not approved. It was just denied to, for a resubmittal for round three. Uh, going through it, just really quick, um, the Liberty Club was the Braille Literacy Project. It's a lib uh, Braille machine for their program. Uh, the equipment replacement for the Senior Center uh, it was a new fridge and laptops. The Lou, uh, that is, if you're not familiar with it, is an interactive um, projector. Jake could speak better to I can, but basically it's a projector from the middle of the ceiling, goes to the wall, and it's interactive. Kids can touch it, do stuff with it. It's really cool. Did I explain that pretty good? Yeah. 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 So if you looked it up, yeah, it's the name's a little different, but um, they received funding through, they applied for your CARES and the foundation, but it's the first one we'll have in there, so it looks pretty neat. Um, so that's what that is. Meals on Our Wheels was an expansion on their program to help slow at the cost for the food and paper products for that program. And then the pool sound system is self-explanatory. Uh, as you can see, we had 60,568 total 40. We approved 54,418. Uh, we will have rounds, we will have funds for round three at about 130,000. So hopefully we'll get, receive more grants for round three. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Puffer? All right, well, all right. Thank, you. thank you very much. All, please, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Um, can you make a change to the wording of the connection sheet? A change the word friend to adopt. Adopt it as if adopt. Oh. Is it the, sorry. Yeah, I'd like to make a um, um, recommended motion to edit uh, item C. To read to approve the recommendation per board policy 2510 to adopt big ideas textbooks and the rest as follows support oh. i was a bit off because i'm using an old version sorry didn't have that one so, um, sorry, just I, for my own notes, so it's a mm -hmm. Stebbin moved and Gerby backed it up. Okay. Yeah. 
for the amendment. Oh, okay, thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion to, uh, I don't have the motion again in front of me. If you would read it for me, please, Vice President Stebbin. Yeah, um, I'd like to recommend a motion, please, to approve the, um, to approve the recommendation per board policy 2510 to adopt big ideas textbooks and associated ebook digital licenses through Cengage Learning for High School Geometry Fundamentals, High School Algebra 2 Fundamentals, High School Pre-Calc, 8th grade math, 7th grade math, and 6th grade math as submitted by Kara Davis, Executive Marco Director Marcos. of Teacher and Learning. Teaching and Learning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Seconded by Brad Gerby. Are there any uh, comments? Uh, no, I just want to let you know that we have been using big ideas in many of our math spaces in the secondary level. It would be a new adoption for sixth grade. We've been looking for consistency, sixth through twelfth, in many of these spaces to better support our math sequencing and instructional practices. So through the curriculum review process, which I'll be talking a little bit about later, uh, this is one of the recommendations on behalf of the math department. Hi. I've caught up now. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the purchase from Enacomp TSG of speakers and signage to complete coverage of the InformaCast notification system at Saline Middle School and Saline High School in the amount of 159575 as submitted by Jay Grossman, Director of Technology. Support, Miller. J.M., thank you. Kirby, thank you. Mr. Grossman, we may have a question or two for you. Easy ones, please. All right, I have a softball-ish <laughs> question. Ready. I, I know, um, for the past several board meetings, we've been approving various additions and add-ons to the InformaCast system. So I guess my question is simple. When is this project gonna be done? <laughs> Great question. This is the last big project we're doing. So um, as we've been working through the InformaCast setup using our different f uh, sources of funding, the last one we had, which was the Michigan State Police Grant, only allowed a certain amount per building. So because the middle school is so large, we exceeded that. And so we were using other funding this year to finish that building up, add some outdoor speakers to the high school just to make sure we have total coverage and we're done. Fantastic. Well, thank you. That's thank a you. that's a great answer. Are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Grossman, Susan? So, so are you adding um, additional features or additional um, like uh, signage and stuff? Speakers and cover additional coverage. Okay. So, so we can reach more of the areas that we've found weren't getting those okay. broadcasts. That's cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, real quickly, we yeah we discussed this like as part of our our finance team, and yeah we just found out um, through that process that the middle school is just a really big building. <laughs> and so because of it, we're finding that if I'm summarizing this correctly, please correct mm -hmm. me, but like that we just, in order to thoroughly cover that building and to do it with InformaCast and as safely as possible, these were the things we found we needed as we went through the process. Correct. Well, thank you very much. Let's, uh, I'd like to put this to a vote then now. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Grossman, I'd like to entertain a uh, motion to approve the purchase of new HP DL325 server appliance from Enacomp or Inacomp TSG in the amount of 201456 in order to maintain current security and vulnerability updates as submitted by Jay Grossman, Director of Technology. Correct. So move, Stebbin. Yes. Support. Tim Eston, thank you very much. Are these uh, servers wearing out on us or are we reaching capacity? Could you just uh, clarify this for us, please? So the current software that we run to maintain our servers um, is a 2016 version. Its end of life support is this summer, so we are no longer able to get upgrades. So to be able to continue that and securing our current infrastructure, we need to purchase a new version of um, our yeah, Windows Server 2022 which will be supported for like the next 10 years, should keep us through that. Um, additionally, this is going to also come with our a phone system upgrade. Um, we're currently on version 11, we're going to version 14. They're same, same reason, there are security patches we can't get with our current version and we need to upgrade to be able to maintain those patches and keep our district safe. Thank you. 
if I can follow up, is it, are these uh, just firmware updates or do you have new handsets that come with this, the telephones? We actually bought the new handsets last year. So all the new handsets that we got throughout the district were in preparation for now upgrading the, the server and the system that goes with it. It'll work with it. All right, yep. great, thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Grossman? No, oh, Tim, no? I, I just <clears throat> wanna note that um, both D and E are not coming out of general fund. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Well, thank not you. coming from general funds. Spoiler alert. Yes, right. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, 7 0. Thank you very much, Mr. Grossman, for your service. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have one scheduled report this evening from the uh, teaching and learning uh, team, and I'll let them assemble. Assemble teaching and learning team. Are you at tonight? Uh, Thank you so much for always allowing us to do presentations. You'll be pleased to know there are no multicolored bar graphs with multiple points of data on them today. Wow. Uh, very pleased. <laughs> it's actually really exciting when uh, Dr. Lotch, you know, we were talking about some of the board reports that we could be doing on the area of the teaching and learning team a little bit more intimately is not something that we actually report on very often. It's embedded into the other presentations that I give. So tonight's presentation is twofold. One is to give you more insights into some of the behind the scenes or behind the curtain uh, work of the teaching and learning team. And then the other portion is for Katie O'Keefe, director of our English Learner Program, to present on our, the current state of our English Learner Program here in Slane Schools. Excited for both. So to begin, while I'm most often, as I said, presenting on the district progress with our MyKIP goals, uh, related student data and staff supports, um, I don't often get too detailed about the teaching and learning team itself. Uh, the teaching and learning team was actually created in 2020-21 under the leadership of Dr. Lotch. Um, and this was with the hope to create more cohesive um, and coordinated efforts to supporting our teachers and thus ultimately supporting our students' success. So this creation um, was really bringing together MTSS, English learning, our literacy coaches, science supports, um, and a number of other administrative roles. Uh, Kevin and Monica are on there as our, our um, student services. They'll be presenting in May. Um, so I'm not talking much about the work that they contribute as a part of the teaching and learning team tonight. But you can see it's a really collective effort um, on the part of the district to bring together important roles to support um, stu our staff and ultimately our students um, in their successes. We, of course, cannot neglect the important partnership with all of these other roles throughout the district. So it's interconnected roles and responsibilities plus. Uh, Teresa Steger, principal of Slane High School, is here with us tonight. Um, and she plays a part of our um, teaching and learning team as an administrative representative uh, because we recognize the important role that all of these different stakeholders play in helping us uh, better understand the needs of the district and dis determining how to best move forward. So in some way, shape, or form, all of these stakeholders are involved in our continuous improvement planning. This is a common um, graphic that I share as a part of monitoring our continuous improvement plan. We're in quarter two right now, so. But what I don't normally talk about or haven't talked about in a couple of years is when you really look into it, you can see that there is quite a big lift on looking at, collecting, analyzing, reflecting on data as well as really recursive cycles of um, partnering with our stakeholders in order to make decisions. So this is all built into the continuous improvement cycle as a whole. And one of the primary roles of the teaching and learning team is really to partner with these stakeholders and then coordinate the actions around these different um, components of the continuous learning plan. One piece that we have been working on really deeply is developing the shared assessment vision for all uh, our staff and building leaders, as well as our district leaders across the system, because we recognize that we talk about student data a lot, and so we need to make sure that we're actually walking the talk um, and sharing that ownership as a group. 
I would, this year we really did launch uh, more into building that muscle where we integrated it into the teaching and learning process. For time's sake, I decided not to go too in depth with that. Uh, but I did want to reflect that here because it is uh, predominant in the work that we're doing because we want the decisions that we're making to be informed by the data points that we have as a district. And then also for our system to be informed by data points as well. And that's where I'm going to primarily be focusing my um, my points tonight on is how we use the data points as a system in order to make improvements um, for the adults who are doing the work on behalf of our students. So when we think about uh, the data sources that we use, um, it's always our hope to have multiple points of data that we can triangulate, not just looking at one. So we obviously use student assessment data, whether it's state or local data, direct communication um, with stakeholders, students, families, uh, listening sessions, district survey data, one just launched yesterday. I don't know if you've completed yours yet, but it is out there. Um, and so that will be given to the students as well. We have internal surveys that we give to staff to collect data. And then um, small group reflective meetings, whether those are one-to-one -one with staff members, our leaders, and or a, you know, a team meeting like a teaching and learning team or a building continuous improvement team um, that might look like an old school improvement team of the past. And as we collect this data, one of the things as a part of building the muscle that I was just talking about, it's been about using that data more authentically and really building it in in meaningful ways. And in order to do that, we have a cycle in which um, the teaching and learning team you know, works to partner with the folks depending on what the data source is and ensure that admin the administration team has an opportunity to look at it and process it, that teacher leaders do. Uh, the teachers and staff do, and then ultimately you as the board and the public too, to be really um, looking at it closely and through multiple perspectives. And again, it just feels really important for us to show because this is one of our goals, because in order to get better at something, we have to be able to monitor it, um, is that all the stakeholders in our system can use the data uh, points that we have at our fingertips. So we've been really intentional about rolling out data sets to stakeholders as appropriate and then incorporating perspectives um, as related to those data sets to get a, a better understanding of how that data influences decision making, developing shared understandings and messaging about what the data actually means and what steps that we should take, and then of course, um, in efforts to be transparent, I'm um, making sure that people can see when we say we're collecting survey data, we are actually using it, um, and here's how. Uh, I didn't include this in the presentation tonight, but we actually have a document, an internal document that literally says shifts we've made in response to feedback. So that because we one of the things was intent versus impact, um, and we'll see that in just a second because we have been monitoring for the last two years how we're doing as a teaching and learning team at getting closer to a culture of collaboration. This tool is a tool from the state of Michigan, and it's it's a pretty wordy rubric. Um, however, I'm going to go through it really quickly. Essentially, we've taken this, and every year, for, well, for the last two years, and prior we had two, but we got smarter last year, and we've now aligned our language so it says the same thing every year so that we can collect year-over-year -year trend data. Um, and because we want to know how is a teacher and learning team doing to influence growth for the district as a whole. So this tool is then divided down into different segments on a survey that we actually just gave last week. We allowed the teachers to have some time and space to fill this survey out um, last week uh, during the early release time, and then last year it was during a cross-district meeting. So we did a really good sample size. It's about, on average, about 250 um, staff respond to this. And it's a really nice temperature check internally. Um, in all of these areas, what I was really pleased to see, and I, I need you to know, that Friday was the day that they filled it out. So I have not done any deep work, but when I was thinking about this presentation, I thought, oh my gosh, you should, I want you to see how we actually monitor the work that we're doing um, to guide our own improvement um, as a team itself and the processes that we're using. So I positioned last year's results to this year's results, and by and large, we're showing improvement in a culture of collaboration. And how my KIP divides it up is, in this case, vision to mission. So you'll see at the bottom, 61% um, was the previous year, last academic year, and then the second percentage is this year. So we've got 61 to 77% of um, us moving in the direction of going towards accomplished and vision, vision and mission. For policy and accountability, we jumped from 70 to 78%. For collaborative routines, I was really excited about this because it was previously 65%, 
and up to 83. So this one was feeling for me like, okay, I can kind of, like I can start to attach and we dig into this with the teaching and learning team, the explicit moves that we're making to the actual results um, that teachers are feeling as a part of their practice and the supports they're receiving district-wide. This one in terms of goals reflecting input, uh, moving from 67% to 74%. Uh, and then this last one, sorry, not this lesson, planning with both district and school perspectives, um, also improving 65 to 73. And then this is one area that did not show improvement and is still falling uh, below 60%, which is, and I've, I've used this language with you before, is like really worth us interrogating. Like I'll look forward to sitting down with the members of the teaching and learning team and ultimately the admin team um, and looking at more closely at what does this data mean, where do we think it's coming from. While we have some, uh, well I imagine we'll come up with some hunches, it's actually something that because it's now two years, year over year, like okay, can we, maybe we need to actually re-ask this question and ask what's influencing this um, to get a better understanding and then better develop plans to be responsive to the data that we're receiving. So that's the one part of the tool that we use to monitor our success and impact as a teaching and learning team. And I felt like it would be um, too shallow to just leave it there. So I wanted to highlight a handful of things that we do explicitly to hopefully impact positively how our staff feels the overall organization is working to support teaching and learning and then of course students being successful in the classroom. So one of the things that we do, we lovingly call these our buckets, is we use the feedback that we receive from all of these different data points, we talk with all of the different stakeholders that I showed you in those different cycles, and we develop a professional learning plan. And that's typically broken up into buckets based on the calendar that's approved uh, by the SCA and the core team. And you can see that we have um, things like cross-district meetings, teacher leader meetings, a symposium, staff meetings, goal meetings, and something that we've been working really hard on um, is that these buckets have very clear uh, goals and that everybody understands what's expected of them, that it's aligned to our overall continuous improvement plan, um, and that the messaging is aligned to policy, practice, vision, um, and the work that we've been doing. So it never feels like, where did this come from? Is it out of left field? So we, we see this feedback, here's all the different points that we make, and then we design the professional learning plan um, accordingly. Another move that we've made in the last couple of years is to build out the curriculum review process. Um, this also lives behind the scenes somewhat, but similar to the math textbooks today, it's a great opportunity in a smaller setting to bring our practitioners together, our experts in the different grade levels and content areas, um, to uh, get at some of the, the growth areas, looking more deeply at the data, and making really targeted improvements based upon um, what they've identified as areas of growth. It also is a great opportunity for us to really scale communication because the people, the teacher leaders and the content experts who participate in the curriculum review meetings then are able to take that back to their either the department or grade level meetings and our cross district meetings so that the message that we're giving has a better, micro, or a, a better megaphone and that that message is much more consistent because we're using the same materials and the same language across multiple spaces. And the, the hope of the curriculum review process is really developing collective efficacy in those four different areas, um, as well as making sure that we are always uh, turning our lens on our diversity, equity, and inclusion practices, and then of course aligning funding and making good decisions that way um, so that we are being fiscally responsible. And of course, at the end of their growing um, district understanding. We're actually at the end of year two, um, and we'll be getting ready to organize year um, Years the next round, which will start next year, which will be um, English language arts pre predominantly and social studies. Another piece of the puzzle that teaching and learning is responsible for is new teacher support. So we always want to make sure we've got all of this information around how do we make sure we're onboarding our newest professionals with um, saline expectations and, uh, and providing them the resources and the supports they need to feel like they can get off to a great start. Uh, the teaching and learning team partners on what this best looks like and then Jen uh, Nelson and Kelly Woodman predominantly facilitate the meetings in partnership with members of the teaching and learning team. And you can see in the cadence of meetings there, I actually pulled this right off of one of their slides, that new teachers, will, new staff will get at the, in the summertime is that they have alternated the meetings to target um, different uh, focus areas to ensure that the um, new staff sees us working in partnership together and that there's multiple points um, for them to uh, receive information, see us shoulder to shoulder, and um, be able to revisit it in progressive months. 
And then finally, another move that we make is to host district collaboratives. Um, these are more like the, the places where uh, we've designed our MyKIP plan, we have our two major goals, the buildings have focus areas, and there's always little um, projects or initiatives or focus areas that come up as areas of needs. Um, so we have taken the feedback, so these come often directly from teacher feedback around things that tend to best pop up as areas of interest. I'll highlight one um, of all of these. Um, artificial intelligence obviously is on a lot of people's minds. So we convene a um, small group of staff that actually is st just starting this coming Thursday. Um, they have the opportunity to sign up for those. We'll get together, meeting of the minds, and um, talk it through and decide what direction we want to go with that just to get a feel for it because it's not a primary district goal and we also want to honor and value the ideas that staff are bringing to the table as places that they would like to interrogate more closely. And the hope is that we are continuing to strive for that culture of collaboration, um, include a range of diverse perspectives, develop that shared understanding and of course being transparent. Um, and I shared a little bit about how we go about doing that. Um, with a, what happens inside of the collaboratives might start small but there's always some sort of um, you know, that's the pebble, and then you get the rings of collaboration that work their way out and then back in as we get, if there is a final decision to be made or a final document, um, we would take that out to leadership at the different levels, then to the teachers, leaders of the teachers, our district committee members if it's relevant, and then back to um, finalizing. So I did want to take, because I won't see you again up here until I think August when I do the district quality report. Um, there are a number of state grants also uh, right now that are fairly significant that I wanted to share with you because we also shared these with our teachers um, in our most recent district update. And we do partner uh, with the district, again, that whole circle, that cycle of um, stakeholders to make decisions about the kinds of um, work that we're doing to leverage the grants that are available to us. These by no means are the only grants out there, but the ones that are most closely related to teaching and learning. So right now we have 23G, which is my kids back on track. We were awarded, my apologies, let me go down so I can actually see it. Approximately $385,000. Um, and that's really, uh, that's one of the post-pandemic um, opportunities for us to leverage funding from the state level to support students who may need additional assistance um, with um, academic supports to get them to grade level. 31AA is a safety and security and mental health grant. They actually took two different grants last year and put them together. They were separate, and that's about $1.2 million. The um, majority of that money is going toward mental health services. Um, so those funds are earmarked to continue those, the student support services that we've put in place since the pandemic, um, as well as to continue to fund professional development opportunities, um, infrastructure updates, and more. And then last but not least is 35J. Uh, this is a targeted literacy grant and there's been a lot of talk about this. We are actually still, we have our budget pending approval at this exact minute, and it's gonna be about $630,000. And the hope from the state there is that um, districts will use those funds to train up all teachers, um, regardless of their content area um, and grade level between K and five, on the science of reading and literacy uh, best practice, so that all students have access, access to the highest level literacy instruction possible. Um, so on the horizon for us, I could not help but put in um, a class. I had to. They were all too cute, so I picked this one. Yes. <laughs> Looking ahead, um, we are going to more come back to that data, the data sets that we have out there. We've got the quality survey, we've got the teach or the internal certified staff survey, plus all the data that's going to be coming in at the end of the year. So we'll dig more deeply into that. Um, continuing to work on those plans for strategically leveraging those grants that I just shared with you. Uh, we're working on a learning framework that's actually been in the work since 2020, but the pandemic pushed pause on it, but it will be um, examples of what we mean when we say graduate profile, when we say collaborative leader, when we say being inclusive, um, and then defining that a little bit better. Um, developing technology guidelines to support effective use of instructional technology as well as raise awareness of time on devices. That's another thing we have in the works. And then more fully auditing the English learning program as aligned with the state requirements. And that's why I thought it'd be a nice partnership today um, to have Katie here with me to do a presentation on the fabulous English learner program, all the things that they do for the kids to support them, um, as well as to have her staff here to be able to say thank you to all of them for the work they do to support. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie.
Kara, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present tonight. And to the, our board of, board of Education, thank you so much again for this opportunity to be here and to present our Slane Area Schools English Learner Program. So first things first, I want to go ahead and just tell you about the mission of our program. Our program is here to support all English learners. <laughs> our program is here to support all English learners and their families by teaching not only the English language but also helping to teach our culture and to bridge the cultures. Um, it's a big part of what we do. And right now, I want to introduce our EL team. We have seven amazing EL specialists across the district. We have Mrs. Kadrovich, Kathy Kadrovich is right back, back there. Marielle Valdez is EL specialist, and she's our, um, one of our professional translators, um, Spanish English. And we have Mrs. Schamberger, who's our EL tutor at Heritage. Again, thank you very much for coming tonight. We have an amazing team across the district. Um, and we also have an EL teacher at the high school, Abby Mayo, teaches English for ELs. And then myself, I'm the EL coordinator and EL teacher. Over the past couple of years, we, we have presented a couple of professional development trainings. Um, we've done present a presentation called Help Save Me, What Do Teachers Need? And then the EL specialists were um, invited and um, invited to attend the professional development that was, a, that was held by our Washtenaw County representatives. And it's, one was called Implicit Bias. And then each EL specialist, and we do call them specialists. Um, formerly, they were called EL tutors. But this last year, they had a title change to EL specialists across the district. The EL specialists were required to attend one of the EL net meetings, and that's um, Washtenaw County. Um, why? So they can either go to the ISD or they can attend virtually one of the meetings. And then every year we are gifted with the opportunity to go to the annual MABE conference, which is the Michigan Association for Bilingual Education. So tonight I really, really want to preface the fact that we have grown a lot over the past five years. Back in 2019, Slane Area Schools had about 91 EL students. When I say about, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. We had 91 students. And here we are in the year 23, 24 school year, and we're at about, again, we're at 140 um, EL students. But even though we've had an increase in numbers of 54% in the past five years, what's really important to understand, to realize, is that we've had a 150% increase in newcomers and entering level learners. Newcomers are students who are brand new to the, who are new to the United States, new to the culture, perhaps new to the language. And entering level students are students who come from a family that speaks a native language such as Spanish or um, an Indian dialect, Japanese, Korean, and they come to Slane schools for the very first time and the children Sweet, lovely children, young fives, kindergarten, first grade, they're immersed in the English language for the very first time in their life. Perhaps never had a play date with an English-speaking child. So lots of great things, but we're definitely seeing an increase in that area. And that brings me to the diversity within our program. Spanish, of course, is still the top language in our school district, followed by Chinese. Then we have Portuguese, Russian, and our Indian dialects. Those are the top five languages. And then underneath that, you can see the other languages that fall. So again, the trend here at Saline Area Schools is newcomers and entry-level learners. We're seeing, um, for, for example, the months of January and February, all of a sudden, just within a couple of weeks, we had five, fa five children coming in from three different families, entry-level newcomers. And we're like, OK, here we go. <laughs> and we were equipped. We knew what to do. We have a plan. We have a roadmap that we created with Washtenaw County with our representative, Pooja Mullins, who's absolutely amazing, EL specialist for um, Slane Area Schools. So we've created this roadmap. We knew what to do. We were ready to go. Whereas a year or two years ago, we didn't know. We, we had ideas of what to do with a newcomer. But this time around, we felt better about it. So with that, there's a rise in, needs, in the needs for students. So when you have a newcomer come to our district, according to Selene Area Schools, Caroline Stout and I sat down and we created a matrix. And each student is a entitled to about seven hours of support if they are non-English speakers, which equates to at least an hour a day from one of our English learner specialists. 
And as you can see, the staffing, or excuse me, the, the caseloads are increasing. So for our EL specialists to be able to give an hour of the time to each one of those students that's new to the district is a challenge, definitely. So, we're def so we see that increase in needs per student. The growth for EL support time per student has increased. The other trend is the Russian Ukrainian population has increased. And then we have, of course, EL tutoring outside of the school, and there's tutoring during the summer. We've been gifted, second time in a row, or second, this is our second year, um, through the 23G funds, I believe. We are be able to provide tutoring support for our students, again, either one-on-one -on -one tutoring or small group tutoring. And our EL specialists, we had five EL specialists, five out of the seven that worked last summer to tutor um, over 20, some, 20 of our English learners. And they did it in person at the library or they did it virtually. But those children's needs were met over the summer. And the children that were invited to be part of the program were students that were at an intermediate or beginner level in English. So at advanced level, we have a number of students who are at intermediate level and we wanted to make sure that they received all that tutoring support. Again, with a growing population of now at 140, we had to choose the benchmark. And the benchmark is at a, that 3.0 WIDA score, which is around the intermediate developing range. So now, let's go on to, so how else do we support our students? Not, we're not just here for academic support. Majority of our time, yes, we support them academically, but there's a lot of other great things that happen. Um, for our students. We are here for after school help. We have the EL tutoring program. The other support during the day is we have five iPads that we purchased for newcomers or non-English speakers. We are able to purchase those with 11T grant money. That's pandemic money. We purchased those at the end of last school year. Um, another support for our students is the EL summer tutoring program, which I've mentioned already. And then there's the digital platform. We have two new platforms, Imagine Learning and Imagine Math, that we are now able to give to the students. Again, if they have a WIDA 3.0 or below, if they're intermediate to beginner level learners, and they have access to that 24 hours a day. <laughs> and bless their hearts, I saw some kids over spring break because we, get the, we are able to monitor the results. And so over spring break, I saw a couple of kids, they were working on it 30, 45 minutes per day. And so yeah, Imagine Language and Literacy. Imagine Math is mainly used at the high school. One great thing too is our department came together and decided we need to improve the EL at a glance document, which is very similar to the IEP document for special education. We decided we need to do something, we've got to step it up and work on that. So we did EL at a glance and then we added required accommodations. So when the gen ed teacher receives this report, they're able to see immediately what's expected of the gen ed teacher and what is the student entitled to as far as support in the classroom. What are, th what are these needs? What, is, what are the needs of this student versus that student? Each one of our students is unique and they need different accommodations. This year, um, we've had the pleasure of working with Beth Russo. Beth Russo is our testing coordinator for the district. And she, has, she and I came up with the list of language glossaries and we had other specialists kind of help out, help out in this area, but now students who need a glossary, those students who are entering level students, our newcomers, they need a glossary, a Korean to English, <laughs> Russian to English glossary. Our students are so academically strong in their native tongue, all they have to do is transfer the knowledge to the English language. And they're able to do that now, and now it show, it'll show us, the results will show on MSTEP or on the PSAT and so forth. So this year we really made it a point to provide those language glossaries. That's a really great step. MTSS ELL collaboration, and that is with Caroline Stout and I. A couple of years ago, we came up with this, the matrix that shows how much time each student is entitled. Um, by, the st by the state of Michigan, we are required to give 30 minutes per day to each and every EL student. Even if they are close to graduating the EL program, they're still entitled to at least 30 minutes of support. So Caroline and I came up with a schedule and her MTSS team follows that as well as we look at um, increasing supports or possibly decreasing supports. And going forward for next year, 
is the 2425 EL service plan that the state of Michigan has confirmed and they would like to see us working toward that, looking at using some of those resources if you, when you get a second sometime tomorrow or whenever you are able to access this slideshow slide again. Um, just click on that, it shows all the resources and service hours that we're supposed to be providing. We're doing a great job in Selene, but we always could use more support with our um, staffing so we can get the students even more. Last but not least is supports for our English learner fam families. We have registration support now for non-English speaking families. I say now, but we've been doing it, but now we've kind of stepped up, stepped up a notch. Um, registration support is simple things like a family that's non-English speaking. They, I get contacted by Mandy Rucky or um, or other, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mandy Rucky or Sarah Ann in registration, they email me and they tell me, we have a non-English speaking family, can you please help them get the child registered? So we do that. In May, we're working on um, hosting tables at Kindergarten and Young Five Roundup. Next thing is Talking Point Communication Tool. We're working on, we use that now, as well as email and the old fashioned phone call <laughs> to connect with our families. Phone calls work really well, but Talking Points, has been really great as well, a really good resource. Third, so the district has approved home visits. Last year we did about five home visits. This year we've done a couple of home visits that's helped to bridge that gap between home and school. It's been a real pleasure to be able to meet with the families there in their home to discuss academic concerns, discuss any issues that they might have, or just anything that pertains to school in America. <laughs> Some of our family em, um, engagement events that we've done. So for the second, second year in a row, we've done it, we have gone to the Apple Orchard as an outing, literacy night at Imagine Movie Theater. We think, I think we've had our, this is our fifth year of the annual International Pollock. And that was, we pulled it off this year with a lot of community support, and lots of donations. Last year with our 11T grant money, we were able to um, take the kids on a field trip to the Toledo Zoo and the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. And we have, um, of course, now 24-hour access to Imagine Learning <laughs> and Imagine Math for our, all of our students. And then we have um, the EO Collaboration Family Resources. This was a document put together by Washtenaw County, um, led by Pooja Mullins. And it, if, when you click on that, again, in your spare time, you'll see <laughs> so, uh, several different tabs. And each tab says, say, at the bottom of the tab, it'll say things like um, home res or uh, it'll say financial resources or resources for um, medical care, resources for home housing, da, da, da. So it's all like social service resources. In, that, in our department, what we do is we connect we connect the families to the people. We have a lot of Spanish-speaking representatives that work for Washtenaw Health Plan, so we connect them. We just say, hey, Adriana Salazar, could you connect with this family? They're new to, this, to our school district. We're trying to register their child. They need health insurance. So that's what we do. We just we connect the families. And last but not least, but our plans for next year, 24-25 school year, we are planning to, we're not just planning, but we're, we're doing it, the EL Parent University Night for the very first time. And that's it. So thank you again very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, we may have a question or two from the crowd. Um, well, we'll start with Dr. Gold at one end. I have a few questions too, but thank you very much, by the way. If we neglect to say that, I don't want to neglect to say that. Thank you. Dr. Gold. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that excellent presentation. I was wondering if we have any um, outcomes for our EL learners over time. Like, you know, how, how are they doing? Like how, I, I, don't, I don't know what measures there are. I, I don't know all the lingo of the measures, but how are the kids doing? How are they getting integrated? How are the families doing? What, mm -hmm. what outcomes do we mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. So first one, how are the students doing? So as far as um, them exiting the program, um, academically speaking, we on average our students exit the program in about five years. We've had students that exit in, within three years, but five years. Um, 
And then if we need more support, let's say some teacher consultant support, it could take up to six or seven years. How are the students doing though socially, emotionally, and feel, feeling more included? Our staff, our gen ed staff is doing an, a, an awesome job, including the students um, as far as like the DEI movement, CRI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion movement, culturally responsive movement. That has been awesome across the district. I know Pleasant Ridge did an amazing job this year at the winter holidays. If you were able to go over there, they had tables set up with several different types of holiday celebrations across the board. So that went really well. Um, families do feel more included. Um, thank you for allowing all of our field trips, for helping out with 11T grant money. Being able to provide all these resources has been great. Um, so the little things like that really help the families feel more a part of the community. Yeah. And then on a district level, um, it is on our we talked about this at our, our last continuous improvement update where uh, Caroline and Jen were both here along with Beth Russo is disaggregating the, gate, the data by students who are in the EL program and or special ed because uh, a lot of the bar graphs that we share are often not then tracking those year over year. We're showing them in one year increments. Um, and with the addition of Ryan Kerr, our DEI specialist, that'll be one of the tasks that I've talked to him about taking on so that we can then dial down and see like what are we seeing in terms of growth um, or areas of ongoing need by, by social identity or uh, cultural identity. Go ahead. Um, so um, I, you were talking about earlier um, the case caseloads um, increasing and um, the number um, of uh, families and students entering our district, um, which I think is great, and that you're, um, you know, the things that you all are doing um, to strengthen the program and um, sounds pretty exciting. Um, so I was just kind of looking at the numbers, and um, I believe like Harvest had like a huge increase. Um, so I, I was wondering if like the caseloads, if you are moving any of the families like to different um, buildings or how you're navigating that, is it just staff members kind of going to different buildings? Yeah. Thank you for asking and, you know, and noticing too, like the increase in student enrollment. Um, Harvest has, you know, it continued to increase in the EL population. This year it went down a little bit, Pleasant Ridge increased, and then Woodland Meadows increased slightly. So what are we doing for all this? There's a lot of those kids went over to Heritage, and Heritage went up, it almost, it doubled in size. We're at about 28 ELs. So we had the pleasure of uh, Mrs. Zivikowski, Angie Zivikowski, she's our EL specialist at Woodland Meadows, and she goes over to Heritage to support those students and support um, Mrs. Schamberger. To credit Katie with um, constantly rematrixing to be responsive to student needs um, and making sure that we have the supports and we've made some adjustments on a district level uh, as the EL coordinator uh, Katie really is centering students first and um, if we need to shift some of her responsibilities in order to meet the needs of the students while we're, we're, we're in current audit of what our next steps are um, we've made some moves in that way too I just have one quick question with regards to Kira's part of the presentation and support for new teachers. Mm -hmm. Are you pairing those new teachers with um, teacher mentors within their building or other buildings? Yep, contractually, um, all new certified staff are um, given a mentor, assigned a mentor at the beginning of the year, um, and that we do our best to pair them with a person who'll be an appropriate mentor for them within the, the, a similar space and content, a grade level area. Okay, awesome. Yeah. When yeah. you mentioned coaching in the upper right hand corner, is mm -hmm. that coaching coming from that mentor? Uh, like no, it's actually in addition to, you know, okay. it's in my notes, and I didn't say it out loud. So Jen and Kelly, in order to differentiate, because it, um, in our, in Celine, our coaching model is really more of a consulting model, and we have a coach and a half um, to provide that um, additional differentiated support for new teachers um, and the staff at large, so it's for the entire district. And so when we um, have uh, new higher classes, they will work with Kevin, Monica, uh, the teaching and learning team to determine what kinds of needs are there, get some feedback from the new teachers, uh, also with Carol Diglio, um, the HR director, and then differentiate uh, those needs based upon the population. So like right now, they currently meet with a small group at Heritage because we have a pocket mm -hmm. of new teachers there. Um, they've done some individual coaching based on teacher goals uh, with other staff members to ensure that everybody's kind of getting out what they need model with the resources that we have. Thank you. You're welcome. As we work down the table, I guess, I do have a quick question. Um, your, your, the training for our teachers, 
Um, I discovered recently Talking Point, which is great. So was, in a nutshell, it'll take in, information out to parents and translate it into the language of their, mm -hmm. their needs. And uh, is there much training needed or required for Imagine Language and Imagine Math, and are all your teachers trained in that? Thank you, that's a good question. I know, um, well first for the Talking Points communication tool that has been very helpful to, and because it comes out as a message, right? It's like a text message to the parents, which most of our parents appreciate that. Um, a lot of our t parents are not comfortable with emails, so we have to teach them that piece, right? So Talking Points has been very popular with our parents. Second, as far as getting trained for Imagine Language and Literacy and Math, our EL specialists, those who are using it, Yes, you know, they've gone through some training and so forth, but staff has not, as far as um, certified gen ed staff. They have not received training in it yet. All right, thank you, I appreciate Thanks. that. I did have another question about our Ukrainian students. I'm assuming they're doing all right. We, I, I don't <laughs> want to put anyone on the spot, but I mean, at, with the, that particular population, we're talking trauma-informed instruction and other... As far as our Ukrainian population refugees, we could use more social emotional support at Heritage. Um, and just thinking forward to um, if you know we start receiving more families. Yeah, we have really great success stories as well as with our Ukrainian families and how they have acclimated to the community and become not only just part of it, but actually looking for opportunities to work within the district. Yeah. Thank you. Down the table. Thanks, Jenny. I um, wanted to give an opportunity. You mentioned Kathy, but could you um, share your colleagues who are here tonight that are not at the microphone? I just would like to recognize them because I know the hard work that they do too. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Miller. Um, yes, we have Tanya Hike. She's our EL specialist at the high school. Tanya Hike has been with us for over 17, 18 years. And we have um, Annette Blank. She's our middle school EL specialist, and she's been the specialist there for 20, 28 years. <laughs> and then we also have Floriana Salanta, and she's at Harvest Elementary. And she's been with us for over 16 years. And then we have Angie Zivakowski, who's been with us for about three years now. So thank you. And of course, our EL specialists who are presented, Mrs. Kadrovich, so there's Kathy Kadrovich, Marielle Valdez, and we have Kathy Schamberger as well. And then at the high school is Abby Mayo, the EL teacher. Okay, thank you. I, I knew you were here and I, I always love it when you come and update us and share with us some of the good work that's happening, but I know that your team is large, so I wanted to recognize them also. Um, so thank you for the presentation tonight, and I'm really excited to see the positive. I mean, you've done so much this year. It, I can see with your team the development of the work that you've done, um, and I, I would love to see the metrics like Lauren um, had mentioned, but I also believe that based on um, observing what's been happening in the schools and in the community when we come to our visits and mm -hmm. um, Steve and Kara both point out things and, and you can see the evidence of the success of the program. So thank you so much. Um, I also just wanted to highlight the new teacher support that, that you've developed and I know it, it continues to develop over time but I really appreciate the thread of support that happens throughout the year because when new teachers are hired, sometimes late in August, sometimes even in September, um, it is a lot to take on. So um, the work that you kind of do to wrap them up in um, support throughout the entire first year, um, I think uh, is, is um, an exemplary model for other districts to follow. So thank you for that support. Thank you, and I'll be sure to share that with Jen and Kelly too. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll try to be, be efficient here. Uh, so I already kind of asked my question to you, uh, Ms. Davis, and, and I appreciate the, the, the question I asked her was, I asked her about how we utilize points of data to, to drive change and drive instruction and, and that kind of thing. And I, I would just want you to know how much I appreciate the fact that you incorporated so much of that information um, in a crazy thorough presentation you just did. So thank you for that, okay? Um, and I guess part of the reason why I said that was because I sometimes will get people in the community who will say things to me like, 
you're, you're surveying us again, you know, yeah. or you're giving us the thir- a, a survey. You're, yes. And, you know, they get this, I like this past Friday, right? I got a couple of texts and we use this data, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so I guess what I'm saying is that when you take the time, if anybody's out there in listener land, when you do, you know, we, uh, we do take this data and we have incredible people who, who these are, this is what they do. These are their expertises. And, and so I, I just want to reiterate that. And I want to say how much I appreciate the fact that that was you're, incorporated. You're so very welcome. You. And okay. it, it is such a part of it that I wanted to make sure to reinforce that tonight uh, because yeah. we do appreciate the time to the community for taking the, the different quality survey, the perceptions of equity survey, yeah. the individual surveys from building principals, um, and then of course our staff too, who tend to get all of those things. Um, and then multiple buildings, you just add it up. I know it feels like a lot, but we do really value your input and hope to use it in the decision-making process. And, and, and I, as a board member, am pleased to hear that we do because I value the community support we have and all the things that they provide for us. So anyway, so so that's awesome. Uh, Ms. O'Keefe, I, I, so I, I'm interested about this increase in, in numbers. And when you have a community events, do they tell you what is making them choose Celine? Like what is driving interest to our district? Is it school of choice? Is it, I mean, people from Ukraine are coming here. How do they even know about us? (laughs) Oh my. (laughs) So no, I have, I have, I've definitely asked that question. How did you choose Celine? Especially to, you know, just currently we had um, some families come in, a family come from South Korea and they chose it one because of because the how of housing however so that was that family it was a housing related issue on a super positive note though our family that just came from russia um and their entry level students um they chose celine they had the choice between ann arbor and celine and they wanted celine so they liked it here they felt more comfortable here and i, I mean it's super exciting when I talked with them over the phone, had that first initial Zoom call. So that's another thing that we do too. We survey the families. When we find out that they're coming, even while they're working on registering, I'll call them and say, okay, I'd like to, to start talking with you and asking you questions about your child's language background and um, what they enjoy. Yeah, you know, Even that little initial piece kind of helps them to decide to come to Celine. So. Katie, is, Katie is being incredibly humble. I have received multiple points of feedback that the welcoming environment that she creates when families call is what helps them decide to come here. And by demonstrating what wonderful resources we have with the teams that we have in place as well as the the culture in the building. And those are direct conversations when I go to the family events like the international dinners and the breakfasts and they tell me. Like when we came here, she picks up the phone, she has the conversation, she makes the time and the space to really make them feel welcome alongside of her team members um, and other districts don't necessarily do that. So, and, and I hear does? that, and I think about how incredible our staff is, of course, and then I also think about students and enrollment, and the, you know, and then how that pieces together with our financial piece, and, and so as the chair, like, anyway, so thank you very much, such an incredible program that it is attractive to, mm-hmm. um, and, and thank you for, for building yeah. it and doing yeah. this. Yeah, we can't forget how, how, how great we have, I mean, how our EL specialists have really, like, created the team they're the ones they, they are the foundation to all of this so i really appreciate it and half the team is here so. I, I don't have much but um a couple things so kind of like what kara just said um going through the whole presentation it, it it appears that it's more than just about education for these family it's it's the whole family in community so I think that that's really appreciative and I think that's great then I also really like the idea of the document you created for the required accommodations and EL at a glance I think that's a really good idea for these uh, teachers to have that so thank you um, first I say like with the new teacher policies and stuff I've, I'm blanking on the new business teachers name but Mayu, yeah, Ms. Mr. Mayu, who came in like third try. I've I had had him. I had Mr. Bramer before, and from like friends and other people um, who have him now, he said that like he's he's come more comfortable now. He's having a, they're really liking him, so that's super amazing. And thank you to the EL team for like integrating all the um, non English speaking people into the community, and that's super cool. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, I also want to speak on the EL learners. Um, it's been really cool to work with them in AP Spanish and hearing from them. I recently took the seal of biliteracy with a couple of them, so it was super cool to see um, them and like kind of work together, especially in that class. So that was really unique. High praise indeed. Thank you. Everybody. I don't think I, we have any more questions, but if we do, we'll, I'm sure we will send them along to you. Via I appreciate email. that. Thank it's you so much for your presentation. Thank you for the time. We have uh, some. Dis Could you? Oh, doesn't matter. We have a few discussion items. I am going to hand the mic symbolically over to uh, facilitator Jenny Miller, who is chair of the policy committee, to discuss four. Um, uh, first readings of uh, policy updates and changes, please. Are you ready? Fantastic. Okay, so if you, let me see if I can get this closer. If you are looking at the packet that Betty sent to us online, it is, we're beginning with uh, page 16 of the packet. Um, I'm using that packet rather than um, what I've done in the past with pulling up the individual policies so that I'm sure we're looking at the same thing. Okay, so uh, these are these were both, um, or all of these were um, discussed during our uh, report last, at our last meeting. Um, and so I just want to reiterate a, a couple of things. So First of all, with Policy 5113, School of Choice program, um, we're revising just some language um, as uh, suggested by Steve um, to update that policy and also so that it's in alignment with, um, with current law. Um, should, we, should we pause at each one? <laughs> that might work for yeah. you if anyone okay, has any so specific let's, questions. Then. Let's talk about that policy, so this policy, if you wanted to see the red and green changes, is on page 17 of the packet. I got new contacts today, and I am feeling a little, <laughs> like, dizzy, so um, I'm enlarging my screen, too, so go ahead. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions or comments about policy um, 5113? Okay, then we will move on to... Um, the next policy is policy 8300, and this is um, continuity of organizational operation plan. And if you look back again at that page 16, there's just a brief overview of this policy. So this is new to us, but it was original to NEOLA in um, 2021. And um, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the COOP plan, which is the acronym for um, continuity of operations plan. So this is um, this requires uh, this is required to be added to our board policies. It is related to school safety, partnership with law enforcement, designated. Uh, it includes the designated district liaisons and required reporting and threat assessments, which we recently heard about from the team um, at one of our board reports. Any questions on policy 8300? Okay, moving on. Um, policy 0141, student body representatives. This was a change that was requested by Vice President Stebbin um, to allow our practice that changed this year of including more than one representative, so with the option of having two student representatives. So it doesn't mean that we will always have two, but it opens it up to having an option to have two. And uh, there's a note there that the scholarship fund is um, allocated appropriately when there are two. Any questions on that policy? I, I just want to note that um, a couple of years back when mm -hmm. Tim was president, you did not actively engage in looking for the, uh, no. And uh, I was uh, not, not, I was just a little surprised, but uh, pleasantly surprised, let me say, that the board president is taking on that role as well. You started it. Uh, Wait, I'm sorry, it wasn't actively looking for, I don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry. 
We're at the, uh, the interview of we, we, student You didn't actively look for or sit down with uh, okay. the principal of the high school to look for a, a, a There was just an application process and then the superintendent and the principal. And the names were presented to you? Okay. No, they, they picked the person. Well, yeah, I got it. Yeah. They picked a person and that person Yes, you, you were informed. So, and then uh, I, uh, Vice President Stebbin, when she was president, started d actively engaged with it, and I did it as well. And if anyone has any concerns about that, I just want to say it's an excellent opportunity. I think it's a very, very good opportunity for the board president to be uh, involved with the selection right from the beginning. So, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for adding that part, uh, sort of adding a new duty to the board president. But I appreciate mm -hmm. that. It's a yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree, obviously, because I was involved with it. Um, but I think it's I think it's important to also note how involved the principal is at the high school as well. So both David and Teresa were actively engaged as a um, precursor to the application. So before the superintendent and I went over there, um, it had been fully vetted. So they're mm -hmm. very involved as well. Mm -hmm. or and, and I like the idea that the president is involved No, mm -hmm. I agree. This particular update, though, is just a revision to the language, um, the number of student option. So one or two students. There was that, and there was the addition of the board president. But that's, uh, that's great. Oh, I sorry. That was not in the notes also at agreeing. the top. Yeah. Yep. That's fine. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and that was pre requested by uh, Vice President Stebbin. So thank you. Thank right. you. I've got nothing more to add. Okay. Okay, moving to policy 6152, student fees, fines, and supplies. So this is a new to us policy. It was original in um, 2004 with revisions in 2021. This was requested specifically by Assistant Superintendent Owsley because uh, the purpose of this policy is to be consistent with the district's preferred method of payment, which is currently RevTrack. Um, and so this policy um, allows for that consistency. Any questions around um, 6152? Okay. Oh, go ahead. So um, this policy was brought um, to the board in December um, 2021, um, and I'm trying to, to remember, I'm kind of looking back on the minutes right now. Um, I'm not sure if it was pulled um, or if we adopted it. <laughs> so I, because um, we did go over it. Do you recall, because you, you became president, I do recall, so okay. if I can illustrate or add, add a little light to that. Okay. Um, we, from the policy committee, we pulled this out because we wanted to verify and check with, with Miranda Owsley, who was not part of the policy committee, about this whole um, uh, student fees, et cetera. And uh, it also seemed, I'm not sure if it was redundant or not, but I, I just, I ran it past, uh, uh, Miranda Owsley and she didn't see any issue with it whatsoever and so at that point I was no longer on the policy or no longer chair of the policy and I it just floated off down the river and I'm not sure but we we need to uh, I, I appreciate that it's coming back for a final vote final discussion so we are that was my memory of it and that's and it may be cloudy but mm -hmm. so yeah. I am I am starting to think about um, the transition of policy chair and how that works because this is now not the first time that things have kind of been lost in that transition so trying to um, trying to update the practice so that that doesn't happen but one of the things that we are changing is that any changes that are made to policy are happening on Betty's computer with the Neola platform so when we're in the meeting instead of having multiple documents running um, Betty will have the Neola platform up and she can make the red and green changes for us on a single platform instead of multiple. So that's one of the ways that we're hoping to streamline um, some of the discussions and revisions that are happening um, that then get lost in someone's Google Drive. <laughs> so we're, we are starting to think about that transition and how that might work so that we don't have 
items that don't carry over from December to January when new people are assigned to committee. And I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I had in my notes, um, I think moving forward when it switched to McVeigh as chair that we had passed it, but yeah, looking, looking over the minutes, um, it was pulled that December 14th meeting to go back to the board, which, yeah, like what you explained, so thanks. Okay, so any other questions on that policy 6152 or any others this evening? Just a note, uh, since there were no comments on these, does this mean we would be able to pop this into the consent agenda for the next meeting? I think I'm just seeking clarification on that process. Mm -hmm. I don't I think, think we need that to have, have another full discussion and, and it can't, public comment. Because these are, because these are not NEOLA updates, it has to go to a second reading of the board um, and then a vote. So it could be one. an action action item. It can be an action item. Yep. That's correct. So not mm -hmm. consent, but what yeah. action. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Am I taking the mic back? Um, yes, I'll save my other comments for my board update. All right. <laughs> and I will pass the mic over now to uh, uh, Brad Gerby for a quick update from the Finance Committee, please, and thank you. Yeah. Finance team met today at 5 o'clock. We had a, a couple things on our agenda and what have you. I'll cover them quickly. Um, we talked about, we started off talking about, sometimes we get FOIA requests that have a financial component to them, and so we talked about some of those things, and, and I'm co we were comfortable with how we're handling those, and we have people that are, are doing those things. Those are important things for our you know, community and being transparent and all that, so that was the first thing that we, we just discussed to make sure about. Um, number two, we talked about enrollment numbers, and uh, we talked about the fact that um, the enrollment, you know, and the impact has on our budget. Now, what you should know is, and I even have to remind myself about this every time, is that the spring count is 10% of our FTE for next year, right? So they do a 90-10 blend, but it's based upon your spring count the previous year and your fall of the like, so like what it really does is we talked about how like we use this number and our number this year is, is a 30 FTE reduction, okay? So that was the number that, that we realized, okay? For our count in spring is that it really informs more our overall budgeting process when we are making projections about enrollment for the 24-25 school year. So, so we do that, and then we can currently look at, and we talked about this a little bit too, is we look at, okay, now how many learners are we going to be taking into the district? And we, we try to get as much information about that as we can, uh, whether it's through having, you know, you could drive by and see the signs around the school. You could, you know, kindergarten roundups. We try to make the best um, decisions we can based upon, you know, what we can find out about how many students we're going to have enter our school and how many are going to graduate, right? And we're always trying to figure that out because, Student count times, you know, um, per pupil allow allowance is, is how we, is our primary funding source. So anyway, so we had a conversation about that because it's important to look at our budgeting and be mindful of that going forward. And I appreciate Ms. Owsley's uh, diligence to that process. And, you know, and, we, we're, and we're conservative about that process, and we always have said we would because we'd always like to be in a, in a position where we can, uh, you know, be proud of, of the things we're doing. And speaking of which, I'm, I'm, I am going to say this because I've, I've heard such, you know, we've, I've heard things as the finance chair in the past month, and uh, I am incredibly proud, I say this every time, and thankful for the team, but I am particularly proud and thankful for, for um, Assistant Superintendent Owsley and how, how on top of things she is, like for example, one time pass through money, right? Like it was, it's a significant thing, but if we don't account for it and we don't have it directly in our purview and in our view all the time, we, you know, anyway, I guess what I'm saying is she's on top of that. She's on top of the one time money so that we don't make sustained budget decisions that have structural implications. And Dr. Lotch has a lot to do with that too, but I think he would give away that, uh, that thanks to her as well. I, I think he'd be comfortable with that appreciation going her way. I, but it should go to yours too. Um, so, the, so we talked about that. Um, we talked 
talked about IT purchases. There were two, you know, large ones, and so we wanted to to talk about those things. And how cool is it that we get to do some of these really neat projects with the grants and the bonds and the things that are, you know, our our district is being really diligent about applying for things and is partnering with the community. And because of that, we get to do these things. So it, I'm 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 excited that our schools are safer, things of that of that nature. Um, Ongoing work for us. There are two things that are ongoing work for us. Number one, we still have a, a goal of right-sizing and, and doing some budget things that we need to do to, to be stewards of, our, of, of finance, and I could tell you that the team is on that. And then the second thing is we are continuing to have ongoing conversations about early childhood, I told you, and budget implications and some of the things that come up with um, – staffing ratios and and some of those kinds of things and how do we partner with you know our community ed department and some of those things to to make sure that we're getting those students and we're capturing them and as our youngest learns so uh, that's ongoing work for us and and again dr lotch is having conversations with legislators he's having conversations with other districts and how they're doing it and talking to people in our departments like one of the cool things that we do is we do have community ed under the umbrella of our school district so we work hand in hand together uh, and so i think that that's a, a really a positive thing for our, our school um and those are the five things that we discussed well thank you very much I have a uh, question. Oh, Chris, go ahead. So can you go back? You said yeah. you talked about FOIA updates. Sure. Yep, we Do did. Do you talk about financial piece yeah. of it? or? Yeah, we, we, we tend to, I mean, we're the finance department or finance chair, finance team. So, yeah, we focused more on the FOIA side of there could be things that people ask us about that have a financial component. How much money, what is this person's salary? Or what is the, info, you know, how much did you spend on this particular program and, and that kind of thing and, and it's more just about like making one sure that we're transparent with our community but also being stewards of okay when we receive a FOIA request how do we do that well you know Miss Yankee's in, you know on top of these things is our FOIA coordinator and then she delegates and says okay and we find there's a process you have to go through to make sure that if um, if somebody asks us for information well there's a redaction process that can happen to for, for um, FERPA protections and, and those kinds of things. And so we, we, we focused more on that and not necessarily like, I don't, I don't need to pass judgment on the FOIAs themselves. So I guess that's, does that answer it? Yeah, I mean, it's good to, I think, um, have that information, especially when stuff gets put out in the community and you're not even you know aware of it I think that's um, important communication and I'm glad that there's going to be a more solidified process with that um, but yeah that's helpful whether it's you know finance policy or just in general um, that that we are informed of that and um, okay thank you and we're and we're still I'm not sure if you just mentioned this or not. I'm, we're still working on clarifying the, that process. Not every FOIA that's requested, uh, right. uh, we send the bill to the person, the member of the community, and they sometimes say, eh, I'm not interested anymore. Right. And so we're trying to follow, just to keep a simple, simple note with no details, it was fulfilled or not fulfilled. And Correct. That was it. Because <laughs> uh, otherwise, we think, we. I was under the assumption that every one of those FOIAs went out to a person in the community, but they don't always. They're sometimes they're just requested and then they change their mind and that's fine at once they see how much the cost is so yeah and the public has access to any um, FOIA requests that are made and received um, people can request to have those materials as well and there are also FOIAs about FOIAs <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. Well, and sometimes it's people like seeking information that's already readily available through our website or readily available through a report that we gave, but they just weren't at the board meeting tonight. <laughs> you know, like, so there are just things that also we can just simply give information to people that, so sometimes that's happened too. Yeah, and, and board members shouldn't have to FOIA FOIA <laughs> as well. Yeah. So, thank you. Brad. I'm good, yeah, unless uh, there are other questions. I'd like to uh, move on to administration and uh, board updates now. Ben is on standby. We're going to start with Dr. Lotch and then begin at the end of the table. Apparently, it's easier for the camera operator to follow us if we follow a sequence. And we're going to start with Dr. Lotch and then skip on over to our student representatives. Thank you. 
Okay, I will begin. I have five uh, positive updates. The first one is uh, with President McVeigh. President McVeigh is one of, you did something good. Um, you're one of eight trustees in the state this time around to um, complete and receive the Level 7 President's Award recognition, with, which means President McVeigh completed levels one through six, a total of 29 advanced classes and a minimum of 1,383 education credits. So that's very impressive and appreciate that ongoing professional development. The second one is for Athletic Director Ashley Mantha. She um, received the National Interscholastic Athletic Administration Association Certified Athletic Administrator Endorsement. That's a mouthful. Uh, and that means she completed five courses focusing on athletic administration skills and passed an exam to receive that credential. So well done, Athletic Director Mantha. Also, uh, just published in MLive, this came out today, and I'll share it in the board update on Friday because it's a subscriber-only article, but I copied and pasted it so you could read it. Um, anyway, so it's four Michigan teens invent sitter-upper for seniors, and this will showcase their work at MIT. This is the EMU invent group that um, we spoke about earlier, and we have two students on this team, Suhani Delayla, who is our team lead and a senior at Selene High School, and Alice Cheung, communications director. She's a junior at the high school. And in short, they're putting together this invention to help seniors sit up, which is a big deal to get out of bed and get out of a chair. I, I know because of my mom, to be completely honest. And they're going to MIT this summer. They're one of eight, one of seven teams in the US um, competing to showcase their invention. So uh, I'll send you the article. It's really good and it really, it really puts a not only Celine in a good light, but how they're working with other kids from other high schools around the area. So it's just really, really neat news. Uh, and then wishing the following teams luck coming up. The SHS Ethics Bowl team is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina coming up April 12th through the 14th, trying to bring home a national championship. And then we also have the Heritage and Celine Middle School Robotics teams in Houston, Texas on April 16th, and they're seeking a world championship. So uh, good luck to all of those teams. Moving over to our student representatives, Carolyn okay. Clark. I have two updates. First of all, congrats to the Youth Council and student government at the high school. They had a really cool luncheon with Congresswoman Dingle, and they had really great conversation that they came back to tell us about. Um, also, me, Mr. Gumnick, and a team of volunteers are working during Hornet time, April 24th, for voters registration. Um, it's really cool we get to work with the League of Women Voters, so we're in the planning process of that to help high schoolers uh, learn how to register to vote. So, yeah. And I just want to say, um, hope everyone had a fun and relaxing spring break, and to all the juniors, good luck on this week for testing. They're taking the MSTEP, SAT, and ACT work keys this week, so that's a lot, but... They'll definitely do good and good luck with that. And with spring sports starting now, it's also super exciting to go support the like women's soccer team, lacrosse teams, and baseball teams. And with the construction going on at the high school, it's super cool to see the bond money and everything input into place finally. And the high school's done a great job with moving the front office to the auditorium side, and it hasn't messed anybody up with anyone I've talked to, so that's also super cool. And lastly, we thank, on all the students, thank the school for getting us the solar eclipse glasses. Because like yesterday when we were, everyone was trying to leave, everyone just, was just turning around and looking at the sun with them. So that was cool. Thank you. Yeah. Don't have a ton, but I, um, and I don't really like to talk about my child much here, but I, I think it impacts the school too. So we were at Michigan State University Admitted Students Day uh, uh, on Saturday and so he's gonna my, my son's going into engineering mechanical or maybe computer science and so going through the um, 
in, in, into the engineering department and just him interacting with the staff in the computer science and knowing what they're teaching in the 300 level classes it, it's just a testament um, all the CIM classes that he's taken and knowing all the different uh, lays and all the different things that we have to offer here it was really impressive and I think the the, the teachers were really impressed with the knowledge that these at least our sling kids are coming in with so that was pretty good um, all right so I have a few items number one uh, so with regards to you know my I want to thank uh, the coaches and the people that are getting our teams and teams and everybody out there doing things you know like I I got an email from coach Stafford the other day and middle school track and she's like we have 205 track athletes and I just think about the assistant coaches with her the equipment the coordination the processing like you know how cool is all that and that our kids have the, that that many kids get a chance to do something right and and be involved and I know it's not just track it's all these other items but like I'm really proud of all the things we offer for kids right and anyway so that is that um, I want to reiterate about testing uh, today exhausting right so every junior who went through SAT and everybody else like uh, to the juniors out there it does get better the next two days I swear M steps and work keys and all that are oh it's nowhere near SAT so uh, I want to recognize I, I, I was reading about the fact that like there it was we had paraprofessionals day and we also had school librarians day and I would call them literacy champions day but like long story short like thank you to those individuals for the work they do um, in our schools uh, the next thing I would talk about is you know I already reiterated about data and climate surveys and all of that I that data is important please fill those things out uh, choir I want to thank them for 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 singing tonight and, and for all of that and thank you for visiting my house and caroling in, in the winter and I that was just awesome um, for the good of the team April 25th uh, there is a prohibited language professional development being offered at the WISD which which room and um, my own child has a has a track me at Bedford and if I'm his only source of transportation I'm trying to figure it out because it does seem like it's going to be something important for us to be on top of. This prohibitive language stuff is going to, or prohibited language and the bargaining that goes along with that is going to be essential to us to be on top of that. So, um, again, that's April 25th. I, I, the time is evading me, but um, 6 p.m. So, uh, I am trying to get there as the finance chair. I'm telling you that right now to the team. Uh, but I want the team to know in case there are other people who could attend, and that would be good. Uh, let's see. And then the last thing I would say, and I'm going to try to say this quickly, is, you know, I was at, at dinner last night. My kid asks me, Dad, what do, you, what do you do? Like, what does a board member do, right? Like, my kid asks me that at dinner last night, right? And uh, I just think about this meeting, and I can't take credit for, like, any of the work that gets done, right? But what I can say is this. Like, if you look at this meeting... We had incredible programs with our, our choir and our hockey team. And those, they're doing great things and they're achieving at a high level. And then I think about like the teaching and learning presentation that we had and how on top of things we are with regards to data and English language learners. And, and so I think about that and I think about, we talked about professional development and first year teachers. and. So, like, I guess what I would say to you, just to keep it kind of short, is that, like, we hired one heck of a superintendent who is on top of having an incredible teaching and learning team and incredible staff members who are doing incredible things for in leadership and in our buildings. And so, anyway, long story short, like, what, Graham, what did we do? Well, we did everything that we did tonight. We talked about bond money. We talked about curriculum adoption. We talked about teaching and update, finance, policy, diverse learners. Like, I'm, I'm proud of what we do. Anyway, so so that is that, and I've talked for long enough, and uh, appreciate it. Good. And if you want to learn more about what it takes to become a board member, <laughs> this.
President McVeigh is going to tell you more about it. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that commercial. I want to just begin by saying on April 1st, our first day back from break, um, uh, Superintendent Lotch and um, uh, Betty Yonke and myself met with Melody String from Neola to get um, legal alerts and um, policy updates. So none of them are... Um, are critical in nature um, in terms of timing, and so we are holding those until our May meeting. So for those of you who um, are keeping track of the calendar, we met twice in March. We are not meeting in April, um, part in part because our meeting is scheduled was scheduled during um, Passover, and so we want to allow for um, our trustees who observe Passover to um, observe that that evening instead of being at a policy meeting. And so happy Passover. And uh, I, do we say happy Passover? I mean, it's kind of, it's a celebration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I was like, I don't know, it's kind of a, I mean, we're happy that people, that it was Passover. Yes, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I know what it means, but I also know like it's kind of a little bit. Yeah, anyway, so happy Passover later this month. So we are not meeting in April. So the NEOLA legal alerts and policy updates will be on our agenda in May, so we can look forward to those. Um, I also wanted to say to Caroline, um, two of your students will be turning 18 on the 24th, so you can register them on their birthday. <laughs> so the twins will be uh, prime for, for registering that day. So I will make sure Ooh. that they find you, and Mr. Gomenek, that will be kind of special that you get to do it for them. Um, I just also wanted to say uh, thank you to um, the choir. Um, I had a student, Otto Spittler, who was here tonight. Thank you to the hockey team. Jack Boyle and Blake Woodrow were also in my class and um, loved seeing them tonight. I didn't recognize Jack at first. Wow. Um, or Otto, actually, and I think they were in the same class. Um, I wanted to say, um, because I believe it is sundown. There's no window in here, but I believe it is sundown. So um, to our friends who um, celebrate Eid Mubarak, um, and uh, tonight wraps up uh, Ram Ramadan, and mm. I know many are celebrating tonight. Um, also wanted to just say that April is Arab, Arab American Heritage Month, so some of our um, community members who identify as Arab American are celebrating, some are not. Um, and so, uh, but just excited to, um, to hear feedback from families who uh, were happily recognized on our social media post. So thank you to Jackie for that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I was really excited to see Pleasant Ridge come and be celebrated tonight too and the work that the students are doing and how, um, how at such a young age, they really are um, embodying the uh, points of the compass yeah. and we're able to demonstrate that here for us tonight and are able to be leaders in their building, demonstrating that to, to new students and to families and to people in our community. Lastly, I wanted to say that April is also the month of the young child um, and I have an early childhood endorsement so that's been something that I've celebrated for a number of years. But this morning, um, it was illustrated to me, and I laughed about it a little bit because um, I was holding my coffee and I wore white today. And I never wear white because I work in an elementary school. <laughs> and a young five student excitedly oh. came over to me and hugged me, and I wore my coffee on my white shirt for the rest of the day. And it just illustrated and reminded me of the work that our young fives and our early childhood teachers do. And so um, whether you were wearing your coffee today or a marker or um, a handprint from someone's paint, um, the work that you're doing is really setting the foundation for our, our youngest hornets, and it's appreciated, so thank you. And now you have a lovely beige shirt. Thanks. Wonderful. I just wanted to, two items to note. Uh, one is I presented last week at the uh, annual conference of the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, ASCD, in Washington, D.C., to share examples of how effective school boards, uh, including this one, believe it or not, uh, across the nation have found unique and powerful ways to uh, engage with their communities. And uh, as, as a, what are you now? Secretary, Secretary Miller. <laughs> 
said, I will be presenting an information session uh, for the community interested in how to run for the City and Area Schools Board of Education. The dates are next Tuesday evening, April 16th at 7 p.m. and also Tuesday, April 30th, the same time. It'll be held at the Slane District Library. Just turn right as you go in the doors and uh, the Brecken Room. And um, the sur this is a service provided traditionally by members of the board who are not uh, running or not rolling off. Uh, and uh, eight years ago, uh, uh, former board president uh, Paul Hynek uh, gave me the, the quick walkthrough. And I gotta say, it was very, very helpful. And uh, I don't think it, it convinced me to run but uh, uh, it certainly helped uh, allay some confusions I had and, and answered a number of the most pressing questions right off the bat. So uh, thank you, that's it. I'll pass it on to you. Um, I had two quick things. So the first thing I would say is I looked at the clock and for over 30 minutes I had a huge smile on my face and that is one heck of a way to start a board meeting. I saw all of you did and the parents and kids. Um, if I could give every Pleasant Ridge student a high five, I would, um, because they really lived their, uh, high performing team principals over on the Ridge. Um, the choir was so fantastic and I really appreciate them coming to sing for us. And I recognize so many people from Beauty and the Beast, um, such talented students. And I'm glad to hear about a few of them going on to, um, pursue their dreams in music and, and keep going on with that. Um, and hockey, I, you know, it's a toss up for me what team at Celine High School has the best hair. It's, it's like, it, it, it kind of vacillates. I don't know, the, ho the, hockey, the hockey showing was very strong though. <laughs> so, um, but it's nice to see your, your teammates and, and, and recognize them. Um, so that was very cool. Um, one thing that I get to do working at the University of Michigan is I get to see former Hornets, which is very cool. Um, so when I can, I take them to lunch or I get them coffee and have a conversation and see how they're doing. Um, I got to do that this week with a current junior. Um, he is uh, LSNA and Ross Cross um, and uh, son of a friend. And it was so great to hear him really... Um, embracing all of the opportunities that we have um, and get some advice from him. I said, you know, tell me about, you know, a few years out reflecting on his experience. And um, I really appreciated him sharing with me. Uh, and I got to show him around my space and, and he got to tell me about what he had coming up. And we already have um, something that we might be able to collaborate on. So I think it's so important to keep in touch with former students and see how we can continue to best serve them as board members. So that was really fulfilling for me. Thanks. Okay. Um, so um, it's just we haven't met in so long, so I'm like tracking back like the, the meetings that um, I attended in towards the end of March. Um, one of those meetings uh, was the CAB Sex Ed Advisory Board, um, and uh, uh, Trustee Gold was was there as well. Um, but uh, they started looking at different um, options, um, looking at curriculum, um, and weighing those options. Um, so each individual person's kind of going through all of those, um, and and so. Um, you know, we got to hear all that and get that information, so that was good. Um, the next meeting is April 25th. Um, the DEI AC meeting was March 20th, um, and there was a uh, working meeting um, with, in which uh, input on the guidelines on the transgender non-binary students policy um, was given. Um, we had, uh, community group and um, invited student uh, orgs um, and continuing to have, uh, they're continuing to have those um, conversations. Um, and in the room, there was small groups, um, got to hear from experiences from students, uh, staff, and families um, who um, are navigating the policy, um, navigating their own experiences, and getting feedback of um, what is lacking um, and needs to be improved, and and so I think it's uh, really good getting that 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 the team um, 
the subcommittee is getting that information, and um, so that was great. Uh, last week, I attended the Celine High School extracurricular night, um, and it was great to see all of the sports um, sports teams represented and um, uh, student groups and uh, uh, Science Olympiad, and um, there was all, all sorts of uh, groups that, um, you know, stu so uh, it was for eighth grade, um, eighth graders uh, going into um, the high school next year. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of excitement for students to show off what, what they have and um, for new students to, you know, get interested in, in different clubs and see what, what there is to be offered. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was happy about that and impressed. Um, so April, um, as uh, Secretary M Miller mentioned, um, is Arab American Heritage Month. Um, a student actually um, made me aware that um, the Arab American National Museum, which is located in Dearborn, um, has free admission all of April um, to celebrate Arab American Heritage Month. Um, I was in Dearborn um, earlier today. It was about in my vehicle. Um, not that, but you know, I remembered and um, you know, working in Dearborn for several years. Um, it's a really great community, and um, I'm excited to hopefully get to attend that this this month. Um, go to the museum. Um, it's also Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, um, and Child Abuse Prevention Month. But Trustee, is it, quick question: the SEAB meeting. What date was that? I I didn't hear. Twenty six. Is that what you said? Eighteenth. Oh, but eighteenth. Oh no no the the oh the next meeting. Yes. Sorry, March eighteenth was the meeting. April twenty fifth is 25. the next Thank meeting. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I hope everyone had a nice spring break. I appreciate the Passover wishes, and um, we sent out as a board Ramadan wishes. I'd like to uh, wish a belated happy Easter to those who celebrate uh, over the holiday, uh, including my colleagues here. Um, I also want to highlight that it is World Autism Month. Uh, I, like so many of you, love someone with autism, and um, and respect and admire many um people and families uh, who are affected by autism in a myriad of ways um, and thank our educators who work with uh, individuals on the spectrum every day and thank those individuals for all the wonders that they contribute to our schools. Um, I also just wanted to briefly invite the community and publicize uh, Dr. Lotch's um, upcoming li listening sessions. It's a really great opportunity for people to um, uh, come meet with our superintendent. So um, I'm just going to read them. Uh, so the first session um, on April 29th for uh, black and African-American uh, families and students. Uh, session two uh, for Asian, Latino, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian uh, uh, is on May 2nd. Uh, folks uh, with a special education interest is on May 7th, LGBTQ plus on May 8th, and religious views on May 13th, and those are all here at 6.30 in the evening. I'd like to, um, just as a member of a religious minority, um, uh, put out a special uh, request for the religious views. Um, you know, we don't really have a way to specifically um, reach out, I guess, for uh, religious views is kind of broad, and I'd like to uh, personally invite uh, fellow families uh, who are in a minority religion to uh, come and have your voices be heard uh, during that group as well. Um, so that is it for me. Thank you all so much for your updates. I appreciate that. Um, Consent agenda time. The consent agenda is listed in this agenda and will not be read aloud. The motion noted will allow for the authorization of all listed items without discussion unless a member of the board requests that anyone or all be considered individually. I'd like to entertain a motion to authorize the consent agenda as printed. 
So moved, Miller. Miller. Support, Gold. Mm, gold, thank you very much. Uh, so without discussion, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. And finally, item scheduled on the next agenda, Dr. Lotch. Right, so we're gonna have another two superintendent recognitions, uh, Auto Tech and Tim Tomosik, and, and a couple of retirees, actually, and their storied programs, and then FFA and Ag Science and, and Dave Meller. Wow. So those would be our superintendent recognitions next time around. And then uh, two scheduled reports, Threat Assessment Overview, and SWWC annual update. Thank you very much. Two, two uh, superstars for sure. The next Board of Education meeting will be held on April 23rd, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. And without objection, I would like to adjourn this regular Board of Education meeting. Of for, April. for the record, can we just yeah. double check for public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. There is this many public comments, which is zero. There are no, there is no public comment. Thank you for noting that for the record. Without objection, I'd like to adjourn this evening's meeting of April 9th at 8.45 p.m. So Thank move, Stubbin. I said without, oh, without objection, a, but if you'd like okay. to do it that way. No, sounds good. All right, oh, we, are, we are adjourned. Oh, I get to tap. Thank you. Or one tap. I was just ready to help uh, you out.